Well, good evening, everyone, all those on live stream and those who are here in the auditorium. A few very important prayer requests before we get to our topic for tonight as, as who are the Magi? I know some of you might have a good understanding of who they are, but many Christians don't fully understand the Magi, and a lot of it is um, not 100% certain either. But for prayer requests tonight, I want to be sure and pray for Brian Williams, Jason Strom, and Jay Miller as they recover from their injuries and their procedures. Uh, Joyce Baxter, who's one of our sweet uh, elderly ladies who is here every time she can possibly be here, but she's been battling blood pressure issues in and out of the hospital a couple of times. Pray for her. And Quinn, who has some precancerous growths. Alice Beck, who I mentioned has been diagnosed with breast cancer. She just finished her first session of chemo treatments, and she has five more of those to go, and there's three weeks or so in between each one of those sessions, but she has five more to go. And the little boy, Theo DiGirolamo, he's uh, 24 weeks old now, born at 22 weeks because of, uh, through cesarean, because of uh, extreme difficulty with his mother, and um, his grandmother, Sally Bourne, attends our church. She attended here for years uh, when we were on the old property, and she rejoined the church a couple of weeks ago. This is her grandson. And then Daniel Skolnick, those who have been here a long time remember the Skolnick family. Their son, Daniel, uh, has blood poisoning and blood clots, and they're trying to, uh, he's getting on medication, and it's very, very critical. And then Mary Olson, one of our young mothers who has the, um, a little girl named Heidi, little sweet blonde-haired, blue-eyed little girl. Um, she's a recent m single mother because of a divorce. And we, out of the divorce settlement came a, a housing arrangement where she now owns a home in North Carolina that she needs to sell, but the home was inappropriately um, leased out to renters, both the house and then property in front and a trailer that she was unaware of until she got there. Well, it's been, this week has been very tense and very hostile with the tenants. The police had to come in. She's just trying to sell the home to get what she can to provide for her and her daughter here, where she called and asked for us to pray. So if you please pray for Mary Olson and her daughter Heidi, that God would resolve those conflicts. She said the Lord sent a policeman yesterday to help with the engagement on site. And the policeman was a devoted Christian and said it just made a whole a great difference in the dynamic of how the tenants reacted to have a, a law enforcement guy there, but also one who knew the Lord and knew how to be a calming agent of peace as well. But she would ask for a prayer. So let's pray for that. And this uh, morning's, uh, this coming Sunday service, the entire Christmas theme of the month, we're having the Ditchfields with us again this Sunday. They'll be doing their two concerts on Saturday at 2 and 7, and then they'll be here on Sunday morning with us. Then the next Sunday, our praise team will be presenting Christmas music, but each one of the messages are geared towards something about Christmas. Last week was the light of Christmas. This Sunday will be the Lord of Christmas. The next Sunday will be the King of Christmas. And then the last Sunday of December will be the giving of Christmas as we try to look at a very familiar theme from different vantage points so we can not just sort of glaze over our eyes and hear the same thing over and over. We can contemplate what does it mean that our Lord and Savior came 2,000 years ago and why are we still meeting in churches and celebrating that day? What was it about that day that so changed the world? And tonight we're going to talk about the Magi from Matthew 2 and we're going to try to segregate the issue of Jesus being born the king from tonight's topic because that's the sermon uh, in a couple of Sundays from now. So let's have a word of prayer and then we'll look at Matthew chapter 2 and talk about these people we call the Magi. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can pray for these names that have been submitted to us for Brian, Jason, and Jay, and Joyce, all who have either undergone pretty severe procedures or having physical challenges that are continuing and and my son-in-law Josh as well who continues to struggle with um, uh, the chronic fatigue syndrome that he suffers from 
that you'll keep them all encouraged, you'll keep them safe, you'll let their bodies recover and heal. For um, Ann Quinn and the precancerous growths that um, uh, she is dealing with and what the best procedures will be, and we thank you that Alice has done so well with that first round of chemo, and we pray that you'll keep her strong for the remaining five she has to go through. For little Theo, that you'll comfort his mom and dad's heart <coughs> Sally's heart as well, and that you'll keep him strong, and may he fully develop, even though he's outside of the womb and, and has to have great medical assistance, that he will fully develop and have a healthy life. And we pray for Daniel, uh, for Ann and David as well, as they deal with Daniel's illness that is, that is severe and life-threatening, that the doctors will know how to best treat him for both the blood poisoning and the blood clots. And then for Mary Olson, <clears throat> that um, she'll get the desires of her heart and that these uh, non-compliant tenants will agree to leave and by the first of the year that she'll be able to get her house up on the market to sell, that she can have the proceeds that she needs to build a, um, a healthy and safe and secure life for her and her sweet little daughter. And may you give her a sense of uh, peace where she can face each day knowing that you're with her every step of the way. And then, Father, we pray for our church services. We thank you for how you've blessed us during COVID-19. We thank you for the very consistent and faithful giving. We thank you for the healthy attendance and all those who are watching on live stream on Sundays and Wednesdays and the devotions. And we pray is that when this <coughs> these restrictions are finally lifted, that our church can return to the vibrant life that we had before and we can uh, learn from what we've gone through and, and enhance our outreach and our time of fellowship together. For we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the things I'm really looking forward to once the restrictions of COVID are gone is having uh, church fellowship dinners together and church activities together where we do more than just getting here on Sunday morning and staring at each other across the aisles and being able to see each, uh, people hug each other again. That's going to be Nice. If we ever get to that point, I don't know how uh, apprehensive people will be uh, after this is all done, but it would be nice to see people going up and shaking hands and giving each other hugs again. There are some who say that will never happen again, that it's now a thing of the past. Um, but, you know, so much of this seems to have been political and agenda-driven. It'll be interesting to see how it all plays out in the next uh, 12 months. Let me read to you Matthew chapter 2, although many of you can probably almost quote the passage. I want to read it to you so we can introduce these people to you called the Magi. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and the scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea. For thus it is written by the prophet, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time that star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child, and when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. When they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. <clears throat> and when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Then being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, <clears throat> they departed for their own country another way. All right, there's a lot in that passage, a lot of interesting little side bits that we won't get to all tonight, but we'll 
at least get enough to wet your whistle. But who are these magi? Who are these wise men? Well, in ancient Persia, for centuries, there was a, a class or a caste of priests and magicians and um, philosophers called the Magi. In the first century of Rome, in of the first century of the church, the Roman historians, Dio Cassius, Suetonius, and Tacitus, they all have in their writings about this group called the Magi who had spread throughout the east, the east of Rome, and they had a teaching or a belief that they had taught for centuries that there was going to rise out of Judea a world leader. Now, many people think these Magi are astrologers, and uh, that so the Magi who came to Jerusalem were these Babylonian astrologers. And just to put a little frame of reference on that, it'd be interesting if they were, because the Bible condemns astrology outright and any of the occult practices. In Deuteronomy, Moses writes, Take heed, lest you lift your eyes to heaven, and when you see the sun, the moon, and the stars, and all the host of heaven, you feel driven to worship them and serve them. <laughs> Isaiah said, Let now the astrologers, the stargazers, and the monthly prognosticators stand up and save you from these things that shall come upon you. Behold, they shall be as stubble, and the fire shall burn them. And there's a couple of other instances of that. So I'd like to suggest to you that I don't think the wise men, the magi who came to Bethlehem, were the astrologers of um, Babylon. There were actually at least two camps of magi in Babylon and Persia. The magi of Babylon prior to Daniel's ministry were heathen physicians. They were pagan priests. And over time, from them came a long line of perverted priests and sorcerers that even showed up in the days of Esther. So I would say it's unlikely that these magi came from that line. But like, and I don't even want to say the party's names, but let's say in politics, there's, there's different groups. Some often appear to be evilly intended, while some to be, seem to be not so evilly intended. But there's certainly two camps. And then there's independents who might be a third camp, or libertarians who might be a fourth camp. But you can tell these are all American politicians, but they're in camps of philosophy and camps of methodology. The same thing would be true of the Magi. So the second group is the Magi who developed after Daniel's ministry. So when Daniel was in Babylon, the Babylon king Nebuchadnezzar exalted him or promoted him to the head over all the Magi. And that's uh, very similar to what we used to have here in, in America. We would have an energy czar or something czar, and they would have a unique authority over an organization to design it, construct it, and direct it the way they want. But this is much more so. Absolute authority granted by a king to an individual to govern over a body of government, that was given to Daniel which would have meant that Daniel would have created a, a, a core training for these magi, a, a particular protocol of practice, and maybe even began to um, gear their belief system to be more in line with the Word of God. Daniel had a long ministry in Babylon. If he was the head over all the magi, we would assume that he took the, the prophecy of the 70 weeks and he ingrained it in these wise men that these kingdoms are going to rise up, of which one is Babylon, and the second will be Persia, and then is going to come Greece, and then is going to come Rome. Although he might not have known those names, he only knew the vision of the statue. And then from that, this stone cut without hands is going to strike the statue and knock it down, and that is going to grow into a huge mountain that's going to cover the entire world. He would have shared that with these wise men. They would have known it. And um, they would have been very familiar with the timing of it all. And as they watched history unfold by the time of Christ, they would have identified by then that Persia would be the, the silver torso of the stature, statue, that Greece would be uh, the brass in the middle, and that Rome was this iron-fisted, an iron um, monster that was governing the region at the time. 
these magi would have known that, so they would have thought the stone is about to come. So I think the magi who showed up in um, Jerusalem were from that camp of the magi, those who were influenced greatly by, by Daniel and his ministry. And we also are told in history that both in Assyria and Babylon, now not all the Jews came back to Jerusalem. Some of them stayed in that area, and they became prominent leaders, and they may have risen to prominence just like Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego and Daniel had done, and they may have been there for generations, not only as uh, satraps and governors and leaders, and, but also magi. So these magi come to Jerusalem knowing in advance who they're coming to see. They're coming to see this promised world leader that they were talking about so much that Roman historians knew that the Magi believe that a world leader is going to arise out of Judea. And they were coming also to worship him. So the question would be, would heathen, idolatrous astrologers travel hundreds of miles, and we're going to see in a minute, into dangerous territory for them. Coming into Jerusalem was a risky venture for this group of men. Would they have done that to come and honor a deity that they didn't worship? And then we see that God not only alerted them when they were in the east, He guided them to Jerusalem, and He warned them in a dream how to leave Jerusalem safely. Would God do that for heathen, idolatrous astrologers? Well, God can do it for anybody He wants. But in the, in the context of the theme of the story, I think we can assume these wise men are of Jewish heritage, of Jewish belief, who have come to be convinced that the Messiah has been born. So they present Him gifts. They present Him gifts that go along with His title as the Christ or as the King. They present him gold, frankincense, and myrrh. We don't know how many magi showed up. The Bible never tells us that. It just enumerates the gifts. Three gifts were given, but it could have been hundreds of magi. It could have been dozens. It could have been a group of eight, nine, ten. Legends have different numbers for it. It's not the number of magi that's important. It's that they showed up in their peculiar role at that time in world history. The magi were the spiritual kingmakers, not just of Persia and Babylon and what we now call Iraq and Iran and Assyria, but they had become to be known as the kingmakers of that entire area. So when they were coming to acknowledge this child as a king, it had held great significance, which is why Herod was so threatened. But the gold is a precious metal that was given to kings, and it designated the royalty of this child. The frankincense was incredibly expensive perfume that would be used in incense and for worship services, and that it signified purity as this child would be the high priest. And the myrrh was a very expensive anointing oil, both for ceremonies and for burial, which would indicate not only that he was the prophet, but that he was human. So he's royal, divine, and he's human, and he's the prophet, priest, and king. That's what these magi were coming to do. So how did they get there? This amazing story about this star. And it's interesting that this week, well, today's the 8th or 9th, on the 21st of December, Jupiter and Saturn will be in what they call a conjunction. It happens every 25 years or so. And it's when the two planets from Earth's viewpoint are almost touching each other. So it becomes almost like a double star in the sky. Well, this year, it's going to be closer than it's been since the Middle Ages. So you're going to be reading things from Christians who are saying that's a sign of something. It means something very prophetic. Uh, it's an astrological or astronomical um, event that is governed by the elliptical orbits of those planets and uh, how they end up coming in Earth's sphere of view. But it hasn't happened for some 600 years, and it's not going to happen again for another couple of centuries. But the conjunction happens often, just never this close. Well, there are some scholars who think that's what happened when Jesus was born, that it was the Jupiter-Saturn conjunction that happened. 
And of course, there's stories about supernovas, comets, and meteors, uh, and what, or, or another conjunction, or a star moving through the constellation of Virgo at just this time. But it doesn't really explain what this star does. This star appears to the wise men while they are in the east. <clears throat> they see it from the east. It compels them to believe this is a sign of this prophecy that Daniel shared with us, that this leader is now here. We must go see. And so they assume it's in Jerusalem. So they come to Jerusalem, but when they get there, the star is no longer visible. The Bible tells us the star reappears, and then it moves and guides them and comes to stand over the manger. No star can do that. No planetary body can do that and stand that close to the earth where you could actually take a line and say, well, it's pointing at that building. That, that's not what this was. It probably was not a celestial body. It obviously was visible, but it may not have been physical. The word that's translated star is the word astera, and it can mean a number of things. It can mean a heavenly body. It can mean what we call a star. It can mean a prominent personality, or it can mean a divine or an angelic being. As a matter of fact, in the Old Testament, that star has meant uh, not stars, celestial bodies, but angel. Job 38, 7, Job says, When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy, talking about the days of creation. In Revelation, talking about the seduction of Satan, of all the angels, the fallen angels, his tail of the dragon drew a third of the stars of heaven. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. So the stars could be an angel. So this, this orb of light, this light being, whatever it was, it was miraculous. It had miraculous properties, and it directed these wise men to, the, to that spot where, the, where Christ was born. But by this time, it wasn't where he was born. That's just the town. It's where he's living. He's called a young child. Uh, that's why Herod required and inquired, when did you see that star? When did it first appear? Because maybe the star first appeared right when the child was born. And then you had to travel. We're going to see from where in a minute. You had to travel to get here. So Herod figures out in his mind, this child could be two years old, which is why he had to kill all the two-year-olds. But the term is, they came from the east. And in Greek, it's tan anatalon, tan anatalon, which means far distant um, eastern lands. So it's not Arabia. It's not anything close up. It's further distant to the east. And that referred to what at that time was the Parthian Empire. And the Parthian Empire was distant east, and it was Rome's main rival, to the point that just a few decades before, they had just resolved their long conflict between Rome and Parthia. Parthia included Babylon, Persia, Assyria, Bactria, and what we call Iran and Iraq, which would be Persia and Assyria, and all the countries east of the Euphrates River. That was Parthia. It was a huge empire. Well, in 53 BC, which is about 50 years before Christ was born, Cassius, or Crassus, excuse me, invaded Parthia, and he was utterly defeated by the archers of Parthia on horseback. And not only was he defeated, they seized the Roman standard, which Maybe in our culture would be the idea in the Civil War particularly of the American flag falling and that the psychological effect of the American flag hitting the ground or being trampled on by the enemy. For the Roman general to lose the Roman standard was a huge psychological blow. That happened in 53 B.C. And then in 32 B.C., the Parthians regained Armenia from Rome by defeating Mark Antony. So Mark Antony is a famous Roman general, the Parthians beat him. And then in 20 B.C., just about 23 years before Christ was born, Augustus signed a contract with the Parthian king 
Euphrates the Fourth that allowed both of the countries to cease conflict with each other and for Parthia to be able to go that way and take that part of the world over and Rome to go this way and take that part of the world over. And it was a peace treaty. So when these Parthian magi, kingmakers, came into Jerusalem, that's why the Bible says Herod and all of Jerusalem was very troubled. This would be like Britain coming back in 1812 for the War of 1812, trying again to take back America, although they had signed a treaty with us two decades earlier. They came back to try to re-seize us. Is that what Parthia was doing? <clears throat> was Parthia coming there to anoint a king that could lead a revolt against Rome? That's why the tension was so high. And not just that, the tension because the people of Jerusalem knew how ruthless Herod was, and we'll get to that in just a second. So the Magi of Matthew 2 were not just pagan astrologers. Um, <clears throat> they were from, I believe, from the branch of Magi that came from Daniel's ministry who were very familiar with the prophetic uh, words of Daniel and other Old Testament prophets that a Messiah was going to rise and he would come from the tribe of Judah which would be in Judea which is where Jerusalem is and then even in Bethlehem because the Old Testament says in Bethlehem and they looked for a sign in the sky and God provided this supernatural manifestation that they could see from the east that made them come to Jerusalem and when they got there it reappeared led them to the home where the child was and hovered above it, stopped and hovered above it. Those, those wise men were probably men of God and then God honored them by telling them to don't go back to Herod, go another way home. So then this thing happens. It's in verse 16 of Matthew 2. <clears throat> then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry. And he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and all of its districts from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. So <clears throat> there is a, in, in the scholarly world, there is a skepticism that this event ever even happened. That there's no record of a massacre in Bethlehem. And because of that, this is a fabricated story. But even though there's no historical record of a massacre in Bethlehem, it still easily could have happened because Bethlehem at this time, experts say, had only about 300 occupants, 300 residents. So the number of children, male, under the age of two, would have been a fairly small number that would have been insignificant to Roman historians. So Herod could have easily have killed a dozen or less boys, and it would have been any news because Herod was a murderous maniac who killed a lot of people and killed a lot of Romans. A few Jewish children would not have mattered. First century historian Josephus said that wiping out potential rivals was something that Herod not only could have done or would have done, but did. And this is what history tells us. Herod executed 45 members of Mark Antony's uh, leadership team, retinue. He killed his own brother-in-law, Aristobulus. Herod killed his mother-in-law, Alexandra. He killed his wife, second wife, Mariam, who historians say he loved her dearly, he killed her, and he killed three of his own sons, all over the paranoia that they were trying to take his kingship from him. And then around the time that Jesus was born, Herod, had, Herod went on a rampage, and he killed 300 of his own soldiers and a number of Pharisees who had said, a new leader is going to arise out of Judea who's going to take your throne. So Herod was completely capable, capable of doing it. That wasn't that many children involved living in Bethlehem specifically. So that easily could have happened and not made the Roman historical records, but all the other murders that Herod committed did. 
So these wise men, these magi, I believe, were godly philosophers of Jewish history who were looking into the skies for a sign that this great stone that was going to come from the skies and strike at the feet of what they now knew to be Rome, that they believed that sign they saw in the heavens was the indication that the king was born, that these were believers who came. And they came in faith, and they came in worship, and they came to honor, and God then protected them. So a few things we can draw from that before we close. God can use believers who are not like us. So there were traditional Jerusalem, Judean, Jewish, temple-worshiping, sacrificing, um, God-honoring Jews alive in Jesus' day. But there were also some all the way over there in Parthia who had Persian culture, Persian practices, astrological information, different scientifically. They were not subjects of Rome. These were high-ranking officials, but they're still comrades of these Jews. God isn't restricted to one particular type. And I would say even for us today, there are people who are Christians around the world who might not do everything the way that you and I would do them, but they're just as valid as believers as we are if they have trusted in Christ as their Savior. Also, we can learn from this, God can preserve His children, His Word, and His plans. Way over there, hundreds and hundreds of miles away in Parthia, separated by centuries since Daniel had died, God had kept these people thriving in a vibrant faith of Judaism while they also worked in in Jerusalem. And in some ways, their faith may have been pure because Jerusalem Jews were so corrupted by legalism and self-righteousness that God can preserve His children no matter where they are. He can preserve His plan that's stretched out over centuries. It's no problem for Him. And His words can remain true. He can keep His word preserved. And I think the fact that most of you here either have a Bible in your hand or you have it on your phone or your computer, that 2,000 years later we have the preserved word of God the exact same Old Testament they had and the New Testament that they soon got. We have 2,000 years later, although many governments have tried to remove it. Third thing, God can make known His will to whoever He wants to make it known to. It's one of the truths of Revelation. I think back to my own salvation. Why God allowed my family to hear the gospel out of all of my friends and all those families and all those people living in Midwest City, Oklahoma, why in the world did God take my family who was not seeking Him, not looking for truth? How did we get... God wanted my family to know. And He had His own plan and way to make sure that I got it. I don't think you and I have to panic about unbelievers hearing the gospel. We just have to be faithful in being witnesses And God will lead us to the people that need to hear His Word. God can make people who we would necessarily choose. It's why so many believers got so excited about Donald Trump and think that he's anointed by God for this such a time as this, and only time will tell if that's true. But God can make believers and even unbelievers rise up to accomplish His will without you and I understanding how He did it or why He chose that person. Fourth thing, God knows the future. He has decreed it, and nothing can stop it from happening. This is one of the themes of Yahweh in the Old Testament, that He is God, He's declared it, and His Word will stand and will be fulfilled. And the fifth thing, God can bring beautiful works of grace out of and in the midst of horror, and tragedy. So this lament of Rama, this this cry of anguish coming out of Bethlehem from the children that were killed, and whether it's one or 50 or 12 or 5,000 would make no difference to every single mother. The loss of their two-year-old child to a Roman executioner would have been horrific. Out of that terrible scene, God could raise up this one child Jesus Christ, born in the manger, living now in Bethlehem in a home, God can protect him, 
raise him up and do a wonderful work of grace. So as we look at all the sadness and all the tragedy in the world and you wonder where God is and why does God allow it happen, believers of that first century could have asked the same thing about Bethlehem. Why did God let those children be killed by Rome? Death, murder, all the sins of man are not God's fault. They come from our corrupt hearts. But God knows our corrupt hearts and he has a sovereign way to implement his will. Even in the midst of our worst environments, beauty can arise because that's his will. I think we see it in the story of the Magi coming. That God told them, let them come see. They officially affirmed the king and they safely left. And then the king rose to be crucified on a cross where above his head it said, King of the Jews. Right, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the, the majesty of the story of Christ <clears throat> and these details that so many think are myth and legend and could never have possibly happen. That we know this is a literal account, as general as it might be, with unique specificity specificity to it, that this is an accurate telling of what happened that night when Christ was born. And then what happened some 18 to 2 years later when these magi show up to honor this young child and provide them with these incredibly expensive and um, official protocol type gifts to honor him as king. But all that was done by your sovereign design. We thank you that there's no situation in which we can find ourselves that is outside of, of your ability to intervene, to direct, to guide, to plan, to move. And we know that where we are right now in history is all being led by your hand towards that ultimate day when this king shall come back to earth as the king of kings and lord of lords and establish his rule on earth. And we look forward to that day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So thank you, each one of you, for coming tonight and for those who are watching on live stream. This Sunday, we'll be talking about Jesus, who was Lord at birth. And let me just throw this out to you to think about. Jesus didn't become the Lord. He was the Lord when he was born. And what does it mean that he's Lord? The word is kurios in Greek. Look it up. It does not curious, but kurios. Look that up and see what you can read about that because it tells us how we are to relate to him that he is Lord. Uh, that'll be this Sunday. God bless you. Have a good night. And thank each one of you for taking the time to come out tonight.